This is just one approach to assessing the acutely asthmatic patient. Depending on the clinical scenario or your own personal preferences, you may wish to use an alternate approach. If this is a new patient without a history of prior asthma, then symptoms like coughing, dyspnea, chest tightness, or an audible wheeze can point you in the right direction. Ask in a personal or family history of atopy, including eczema, hay fever, or food allergies. Additionally, it can be helpful to assess for exposure triggers, such as preceding illness, inhaled allergens, smoke exposure, or the use of NSAIDs, and the quickness of onset. Did the symptoms begin suddenly, or did the patient deteriorate more gradually before acutely worsening? Precipitate attacks are more likely to show greater improvement with treatment. In patients with established asthma, some details that we may like to discover include have they been on any asthma medications and have they been taking them as prescribed, how often do they use their reliever inhaler, and how many times did they use it during this exacerbation, do they monitor their peak flow, and what was their last measurement, have they needed to visit their GP out of hours or the hospital because of exacerbations, how often and when was the last time, have there been any previous severe exacerbations, and how about previous intubations or ICU admissions. The general assessment is usually completed very quickly and normally while taking the history. It involves observing the patient globally and asking yourself, how do they appear? Are they in distress? Observe the level of consciousness. Is the patient awake and alert? Or, for example, are they drowsy, agitated, irritable, confused, or even unconscious, a pre-morbid sign? Can the patient speak? And if so, can they do so in full sentences, indicating good respiratory reserve? Or conversely, are they too breathless to talk? Are they sweating or exhausted? How about cyanotic, which is another preterminal sign? If the patient is very young, are they crying, which would at least provide evidence of an open airway? And in infants, in whom speaking ability cannot be assessed, difficulty feeding is reflective of respiratory distress. The vital signs are important for obvious reasons. The degree of tachypnea and the oxygen saturations can help differentiate between a severe and a life-threatening attack. Often, the patient will already be on oxygen when you assess them, in which case don't be fooled by normal oxygen saturation. Tachypnea is characteristic of an asthma exacerbation, but a decreasing respiratory rate need not be a good sign. In combination with fatigue and decreased alertness, impending respiratory arrest must be considered. The blood pressure can be elevated due to catecholamine surge, and potentially hypercarbia, or decreased, for example, due to dehydration. And while tachycardia is common, a rising heart rate can indicate worsening asthma. As well, bradycardia in a life-threatening asthma attack is a preterminal event. Finally, pyrexia can occur due to concomitant infection. We then quickly move on to a respiratory exam, which we have already partly assessed. Pay attention to signs of increased workup breathing and the use of accessory muscles of respiration resulting in, for example, subcostal and intercostal retractions or tracheal tug. In babies, look for nasal flaring, grunting, head bobbing, and paradoxical movements of the abdomen and chest. If work of breathing is increased, ask yourself, is the patient compensating? And if the patient is a baby, are they playing or can they be distracted? Or do they appear to be tiring and disinterested? In chronic cases, chest wall remodeling may alert you to the severity of the underlying condition. While oscillating, assess if there is good air entry or if it is reduced. Is the expiratory phase prolonged? Are there any adventitious breath sounds? How about wheezing, which is usually expiratory but can become biphasic or even disappear with increasing airways obstruction? A silent chest is a very worrisome finding. In regard to the cardiovascular exam, it is important to assess the pulses. In severe status asthmaticus, you may notice pulses paradoxes. That is, when the patient inspires, there is a decrease in pulse amplitude, which leads to the peripheral pulse not being palpable. Also, because patients with severe asthma are often clinically dehydrated, it is important to assess hydration status as well. If you haven't done so already, it is helpful to additionally assess the capillary refill time, mucous membranes, skin tuger, and in infants the fontanelles, which in combination with the blood pressure and pulse quality can help you determine the hydration status of the patient. This concludes the initial assessment of a patient with acute severe asthma, the severity of which is established by using these findings and is based on asthma guidelines wherever you work. Because they can vary, I've not listed them here. Also, keep in mind that although the peak flow measurement is often listed, 
it is unlikely to be helpful in younger children or in those with very severe dyspnea. I hope you found this lecture to be helpful and worth your time. Please feel free and very welcome to leave a comment or suggestion below. And if you like this video, please hit subscribe and check out some of the other videos in this channel.